Mrs. Paquita was living her last days in a hospital because she suffered from an incurable lung disease that even made her lose her voice. Her son Wilmer visited her frequently, and one of these occasions he noticed that his mother became uneasy when one of her nurses entered her room. Immediately, the man suspected that something bad was happening. Well, his mother had appeared with bruises on her body, so determined to find the truth, he installed hidden cameras, and what he discovered was truly shocking. Mrs. Paquita is one of those unfair cases in which people who don't smoke end up paying for the consequences for those who do. Well, she didn't have any vice, but in her patterns they were compulsive smokers, and she inhaled all that smoke for 30 long years until her lungs began to collapse. Paquita was a humble girl who began to work at an early age with her mother, collecting scrap metal in a cart through the main streets of the city to later sell it and obtain income that allowed her to feed herself with the two other children of the lady who had been abandoned by her partner. Paquita never complained about that fate, so she worked with great dedication with her mother and promised that she would one day get a better job to support her and that she would no longer go around collecting scrap metal. The lady listened to her attentively and simply smiled. Months before she was 15 years old, a neighbor told Paquita that the house where she worked at needed someone to clean the bathrooms only, and the salary was not negligible. So the teenager, with her mother's permission, showed up for work, and seeing that she was very efficient, they hired her to take care of general cleaning. She thus began to work, and as the years progressed, the bosses had more confidence in her, to the point that they trained her to be a kind of assistant in the sense that she was in charge of house purchases, payments, going to the bank to withdraw and deposit money, among other trusted functions. Thanks to that work, Paquita was able to fulfill her mother's promise that she would keep her as a queen. Well, the lady no longer went out to work, she had her food assured, she had improved the house, and in reality her standard of living was very good. She even had enough to support her siblings. Later, the owner of the house asked Paquita to be a kind of companion. Thus, the young girl began to frequent the social circle to accompany the lady who bought her fine dresses, shoes that she never imagined she could wear, even jewelry. The lady introduced her to society as a niece of hers, and she accompanied her almost always. Both the wife and the husband had the habit of smoking, so Paquita began to inhale third-party smoke from a very young age, and that's how her lungs gradually became ill, even though she never had a cigarette in her mouth. In social events to which she accompanied her employer, she met Fidel, the son of some neighbors of the mansion, who fell in love with Paquita, but only deluded her, made her pregnant, and disappeared from her life. From that relationship, Wilmer was born, for whom she worked all her life, Mrs. Paquita. The boy, he trained academically and became a great veterinarian. He worked in the capital, however, despite his distance from her, he was always aware of his mother. When his lung disease was discovered, there wasn't much to do and he stopped working. Upon learning that the medical problem advanced into her cough, she was uncontrollable. The specialist recommended that she be admitted to the Chronic Pulmonary Diseases Sanatorium so that she could be better cared for. Wilmer admitted to her and, at the beginning, he was happy with the care he had for his mother there. Until months later, the lady lost her speech and it was him that began to notice her strange behavior. Every time Nurse Lucy came to her room, Wilmer felt that Miss Paquita wanted to tell him something about it. That woman and the last straw that spilled the glass when he arrived and found his mother with bruises. And when entered the nurse, she became restless and tried to speak. Wilmer immediately left the room and went to the site manager to ask him to investigate the nurse. The doctor wanted to explain some things to him, but the man was very angry. He just left the office and came back in the afternoon to see his mother. Without saying anything else, a week later he came back and was told by the director that he had hidden cameras installed and that he wanted to review the content of them. When they hooked up the footages and records from the camera to the computer, Wilmer couldn't believe it. He began to cry, and when Lucy, the nurse, arrived at the office, the man fell on his knees before her. He wept without saying a single word. In the video, the woman appeared filling the lady with pampering, hugging her until she fell asleep. She read her some stories, and even she came to take care of her when she was not on her shift, because she reminded her a lot of her mother. Lucy had lost her mother 20 years ago, and believed she saw her and Miss Paquita, 
so she took extreme care of her, worried about feeding her and stayed with her even when she should have been at her house resting for work. For this reason, the lady was so reassured when she watched her enter the room, and Wilbur was really sorry because he found out that the bruises were due to the lady having fallen out of the bathroom. Wilbur not only apologized to Lucy, but he also assigned her an extra salary. One of the Chinese proverbs says, If you want to be happy for an hour, go take a nap. Go fishing if you want to be happy for a day or two. If you want to be happy for a year, you should inherit a wealth. If you want to be happy for the rest of your life, help someone. Since ancient times, the greatest thinkers have all advocated the same conclusion. Happiness may be obtained by assisting others. As a result, we learnt at a young age that it was better to give than to get. The old saying is ingrained in our minds from the moment we bite into the first slice of a shared birthday cake. Is there, however, a deeper truth hidden behind the truism? The answer is a resounding affirmative. Anecdotal evidence suggests that giving is a powerful pathway to personal improvement and long-term satisfaction. Scientific studies provide solid facts to support the claim. We now know that giving activates the same areas of the brain that are excited by food and sex, thanks to advances in functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI. Experiments have found evidence that altruism is encoded in the brain and that it's a pleasurable emotion to experience. Giving back to others may very well be the key to living a life that's not just happier, but also healthier, wealthier, more productive, and more meaningful. However, it's vital to note that giving is not always a pleasurable experience. Giving may leave us feeling empty and taken advantage of, and this is entirely possible. Some suggestions to assist you, give not until it hurts, but until it feels fantastic, are as follows. One. Discover your life's purpose. Our giving should be motivated by our own personal passions. It's not the amount of money we give that matters, but the amount of love we put into our giving. It's only normal that we'll be more concerned with this and less concerned with that, and that's just okay. What we choose should not only be the right thing to do, but it should also be the right thing for us as an individual. 2. Dedicate some of your time. The gift of time is typically more precious to the recipient and more fulfilling to the giver than the gift of money. It's often more difficult to donate time than money. We don't all have the same amount of money, but we all have time on our hands, and we can all give part of that time to help others, whether that means devoting our entire lives to service, or simply giving a few hours each day, or a few days a year to charitable endeavors. 3. Donate to organizations with well-defined goals and outcomes. According to Harvard scientist Michael Norton, giving to a cause that specifies what they're doing with your money leads to more happiness than giving to an umbrella cause where you're not sure where your money's going. 4. Look for ways to combine your personal interests and abilities with the needs of others. Giving without expecting anything in return can quickly become overwhelming in the absence of natural survival impulses, according to Adam Grant, author of Give and Take. In order to be otherish, which he describes as being willing to give more than you receive, while yet keeping your own interests in mind, you must first understand yourself. 5. Take a proactive approach rather than a reactive one. We've all experienced the anxiety that comes with being coerced into making a donation such as when friends ask us to contribute to their fundraising campaigns. In these situations, we are more inclined to give in order to avoid embarrassment than we are to offer out of charity and compassion. This style of offering will not leave you with a pleasant glow feeling. Instead, it will most likely leave you with resentment. Instead, we should set aside some time to reflect on our alternatives and identify the most appropriate charity to support based on our principles. Six. Do not succumb to the pressure of guilt into making a donation. I don't want to dissuade people from donating to worthy charities simply because doing so doesn't always make us feel better. What a miserable, opportunistic society it would be if we just donated in order to receive something in return for every donation we made. However, if we feel compelled to donate because we're feeling guilty, it's likely that we will not be highly dedicated to the cause over time. The important thing is to discover a method that works for us.
When we do, the more we give, the more likely it is that we'll find meaning, purpose, and happiness in our lives. All the things that we seek in life, but find so difficult to come by. Friends, Wilmer's distrust led him to discover a great truth and to regain faith in humanity. Because in life, not everything is evil. There are still good people capable of selflessly giving themselves to others. This is where our story ends today. We hope that it's been to your liking, and we invite you to join us in an upcoming video. Until next time. Thanks for watching. Please like and share the video in social networks. We'll be right back to you as fast as we can.